been driven by Corporal Al Hernandez, had problems with the electrical system in his car, and I went to give him a hand. <laughs> what happened? I don't know. She just died on me. You got cables? 127, hold up alarm, 7405 New Hampshire. 110 here, 127's car is out of service. I'll take the call. 143, you available for backup? 143, rolling as backup. Looks like you're out of this one, Al. Call the truck, take it on in. When I did my U-turn, the rear end of my car slipped on some ice. I read it off Sir Bauer on my backup and told him, slow and easy does it. I cut my sign when I got within hearing distance of the pancake house. Then I shut off my emergency lights just before the building came into view. In 18 years, I'd arrived at the scene of an alarm maybe 5,000 times. And so far, there was nothing unusual about this call. Harvey, Harvey, he's inside. The robber? No, he has no robber. Harvey, please, he's very disorderly. There's no robber? I had no choice. I had to ring the alarm. Harvey, please, he's hey. breaking a heck of a racket hey, in there. Hey, hey, hey. Is this guy armed? Look, I don't know. Please, my restaurant. I couldn't see anyone from where I was standing, and I didn't hear anything either. But I knew there was only one way I was going to be able to get any more information. When I saw James Campbell for the first time, I knew there was something wrong with the guy. Really wrong. I couldn't tell if he was on drugs or if he just lost it completely. I'd encountered both types and none had ever turned violent. I was a little concerned because he was so big. I know they are. Just take it easy now, buddy. What's going on? Drunks you can work by just sweeping their legs and down they go. But sweeping this guy would be like trying to sweep a tree. Look, my name's Bob. What's yours? The only way I was going to get him into a pair of cuffs was to talk him into them. Look, I know you're upset about something, but... I just want to talk, that's all. I've told you my name, why don't you tell me yours? I ain't telling you nothing. I need a new bottle of ketchup, man. More ketchup, that's all. Uh, I got an idea. Why don't you and me uh, get out of here and, and go talk? No, man, no! Okay, okay, fine. We'll talk right here. Sure would help if I knew who I was talking to. James! Good, that's good. James. You're by yourself? I had a fight with my girl. She ran in here. I came looking for her. That's all. OK. OK, now, James. We got a problem here, right? But but I think we can work it out, you know? Uh, I have this, this friend. He talked to people. Now, why don't you put that bottle of ketchup down? We no! It wasn't how I'd hoped to disarm him, but at least he no longer had the bottle. Now I had to think of some way to settle him down. You're a cop, man. A cop. Stay away from me now. Listen to me now, James. I'm not going to take you in. You a damn lie. I wasn't lying. I wasn't going to take him to jail. I wanted to commit him for a psychiatric examination. He would be off the street, unable to hurt anyone, and he'd be in the right place to get help. I, I do. I have this buddy. And, and he can help you. He's not going to hurt me? No. Nobody's going to hurt you. I promise. Now, just turn around and put your hands on the counter. Now, in a short drive, we can get down there. I'm going to take a little while, and we can talk to the buddy here. Now, just... Just put your hand behind your back, Jay. The chief tells me I gotta put the handcuffs on anyone who rides in my car. The regulations, their pain, I know. I'm sorry, but I gotta follow them. Now, come on. Doing good now. Doing real good. That's good, James. That's good now. Now, just give me the other hand now, and we can, uh, we can get out of here. Yeah, that's good. You're doing good. That's good, James. Now, just turn around. Oh, oh, oh. He was stronger than I thought, but I hoped I could drive him to the floor. Well, my feet were wet from the snow outside, and they slid out from under me. This gave him a couple of precious seconds. I don't know how many times he hit me, but every time he did, I could feel my skull bulge some more. My brain said squeeze, but my trigger finger wouldn't respond. It was paralyzed. He just reached down and pried the gun from my hand. It was like taking candy from a baby. 
I stayed on my stomach because I figured I could do more than I could on my back. I used to wrestle, and your back is the one place you don't want to be. Strangely enough, I started thinking about my elementary school principal, who used to tell us to duck and cover during H-bomb drills. So I put my hands over my head for cover, just like she said. From the sound of the shots, I figured he was standing right over top of me. I knew I had to be able to see him to fight him, so I played possum until he thought I was really dead. Later, I'd found out he hit me two times, once in my thigh and once in my head, though the bullet was slowed down by my wrist and didn't penetrate my skull. I couldn't make any outward motions, but I had to find out what was working and what wasn't. I wiggled my toes inside my boots, and I could feel them move. I checked my ankles, my legs, calves and thighs, the back muscles, everything answered. I could even move the fingers of my right hand again. Whatever had happened before was only temporary. I figured by now he must have been convinced I was dead. He wasn't watching me anymore. So I started to reach for my automatic that I kept hidden in a shoulder holster under my jacket. I knew if he suddenly turned around and saw me, he might shoot again. And this time I might not be so lucky. Officer Boward arrived on the scene and the people from the restaurant told him there was a hell of a fight inside and shots had been fired. You heard gunfire? Yes, they gave him insight. Okay, you stay out here. I knew he hadn't crossed in front of me. I would have seen him. I didn't hear him move to my left either. So I figured he was straight ahead of me. And there could only be one reason. He was getting ready to ambush my backup. Despite everything that had happened, I still didn't want to kill him. But when he saw me, I had no choice. It was either him or me. I was having a hard time keeping conscious now. Everything kept fogging up on me. I'd heard stories about people falling asleep after being hit on the head and never waking up. So I decided I wasn't going to be one of them. I just kept focusing on Campbell. Sarge! Where's he at? He's out right here on the end of my gun. At first, it bothered me that I didn't feel any regret about killing James Campbell. So I talked to the department chaplain, Father Sal, about it. He said it wasn't really me that did the killing. It was my training. It just took over. That and my will to survive kept me going. Without them, the whole thing might have ended differently. Take my gun, Power. It's loaded. I've thought about what happened three or four times a day, every day since it happened and there's nothing I could have done differently. The only thing I regret is that because of what happened, I'm no longer a police officer. I miss the work, the challenge of the investigations, and the camaraderie I had with all my fellow officers. I don't know. For 18 years, it was the only job I knew. But life has changed for me now, and I miss being a cop every single day. Top Copsy is brought to you in part by Pringle Soap. Pearson risks his own life to save another officer. When I started, New London was a nice, quiet, New England city. The type of crime we saw then was completely different than what we see now. Maybe during the summer it would get busy at the local beach. On a Navy payday, some of the military people would get involved in scrapes, but nothing serious. Certainly not the nightmare of drugs. Things started to change in the 60s, and now it's really a nightmare. I don't recall having a prostitution arrest in London until the mid-70s. But all of a sudden, we noticed an awful lot of prostitutes on the street. And we had a major problem on our hands. There's three of them in one car. Get a shot of that. I don't know how much of this they can run at the family out. They'll show it. People in this area have spent a lot of money on their horns. They're fed up. You see what I mean? Why isn't the police department doing something? And if they're not doing something, it means they're condoning what's happening. Condoning, shit. We are shoveling people into jail. Yeah, getting to talk to my wife. I start at six and at seven in the morning, I'm still here writing reports. Yeah, I busted six girls last night, alone. Terry and Bill ended up directing traffic to keep all the Johns away from me. <laughs> hey, I know you're all doing your best, okay? It's a rotten detail, but we do what we can. And for what it's worth, I still like you. <laughs> Trish, get wired up. <laughs> you're eager. Okay, let's get going. Maybe tonight we'll turn the corner. Captain Pearson? Uh, we're from Channel 26. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the press will be covering us tonight. Captain, uh... Trish, they know they're not allowed to reveal your face. They just want to shoot parts of the operation. It'll be a chance for the people to see that you're doing your best. Well, let's go do our best, boy. You better. <laughs> 
We started running stings in 87, and we were chasing them off the streets, but not eradicating them. They would just move from one spot to another. It was really a game we were playing, but we were having an impact. There weren't as many girls on the street. You just have to stay on top of it if you can find the money. Foremost, we always wanted to protect an undercover officer. And if we thought we didn't have a good arrest, we would have bought it. The guy got to have his day in court. And with reputations, jobs, and God forbid, marriages on the line, we had to have an airtight case. The basic setup involved as many as 16 people. The undercover policewoman, a backup car, another vehicle with arresting officers to pick the Johns up, and then you needed a marked car with uniformed police officers in case somebody decided to flee. You're talking about a big operation. I would be in the monitoring van watching Trish and listening to the wire. I coordinated the whole thing with Bill Gavitt. We would tell her, or Trish would tell us if something was wrong, by way of a signal, we would then abort the operation. Hi, honey, you looking for a date? Maybe. You want to get in and talk about it? Why don't we talk about it first? Look, get in. I'm losing heat with this window. Come on, get serious or get lost. <laughs> bus in two hours. She's just in the work. Yeah, let's grab a coffee. She must be freezing to death out there. Ladies and gents, that's a coffee break. Terry, give Trish a ride back in. Is it usually this slow? I mean, one arrest every hour? Uh, it depends. It's cold tonight. It's wet. Business is off. Wouldn't it be easier if she went with the guys in town? I mean, don't they get suspicious if she doesn't get in the car? The duck never gets in the car. Duck? Me, the undercover. It's too dangerous. Maybe we should risk it. No way. I'm sure that we could control it, John. I don't want Trish getting in the cars. John, if it'll help. No. Yeah, if she gets in any trouble, well, we can get to her in 30 seconds. It's not safe. Just, we've got enough guys. Hey, it's not going to happen. Well, we better get out of here. Don't you go getting in any cars. You hear? Yeah, okay. John. Thanks. When it comes to the music of the 90s, anything goes. Yours. We'll be right you can't top the copper top. Trish made the deal through the windows and then walked around the car and read the license plate so we would hear it and record it over the wire. And then she'd say, go down the alley because there are too many cops around here. And that's when he got last sued. It worked beautifully. You never make this stick. It's your word against mine. It's all on tape, sir. You want this played in court to the whole world? Here's what you want me to do? That's your privilege. Nine out of ten times, they would say, let's just forget about it. We're settling out of court. Thanks, Trish. Go on back to your location. Start rolling when it comes by again. It's coming back. Yeah. Blue Chevrolet. Hi. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> Not Working? too bad. What do you charge? Depends what I'm charging for. You're not a cop, are you? No, I'm not. Are you? Are you kidding? What are you looking for? As much loving as I can get for twenty dollars. <laughs> I got the picture. There's too many cops around here. Pull into that alley. 
I'll meet you there in a minute. <laughs> Don't keep me waiting. Ooh. <laughs> Connecticut plate 775 TVK. Get down! All units, he just pulled into our driveway. You want to board? No, no. Everybody stay put. We'll be the arrest team on this one. There was just something about this guy, a gut feeling. I just Play didn't like him. I felt there was something wrong here. Trish walked up and opened the passenger door to speak to him. Hi. They were now only a few feet away. Gavin was hoping to get some more evidence on the guy. But I thought we had enough, so I said, let's go. Oh, no, no, not yet. He's close enough to grab her. Let's take him. Police, you are under arrest. Turn off the car. Come out with your hands up. Come on, stop the damn car. Trish, get out of the way. was twisted and decided he was dragging along the ground. And my knee was dragging on the pavement. And the guy was biting my arm while he was fighting. Go around, cut the bastard off. The whole time I was being dragged, I was worried Trish was being dragged on the other side. I felt I had to stop him to save her. I just felt something else crushing me. The two cars crashed together, and I was pinned in between. Jerry, take it easy. It's OK. Let's look. Trish. I'm OK, John. I'm right here. She got free before he dragged you off. My wife. Get my wife. I already called her. She'll meet us at the hospital. Tell her I'm all right. Shh. Don't talk. It'll be okay. How is he? Do you have a comment? Yeah. You still think we're not doing our job? I was relieved that Trish was okay, but I was in an awful lot of pain. It felt like William Refrigerator Perry was standing on my chest. I would broke seven ribs. i have been in so many battles. I've been banged and kicked and spit on. I've been involved in incidents with weapons and fist fights, but here I didn't have control of anything. I didn't know where the hell he was taking me, and I was afraid if I let go, I would go into the wheels of the car, or Trish would be crushed on the other side. I think I attribute people's feelings about policemen to television. Television has been a big educator. When people see a police story where a crime is solved in 60 minutes, all the paperwork is done and the bad guys locked up, they wonder, how the hell come you guys can't do that? Top Cops returns in a moment with the aftermath of... In a taste test, James Campbell died of multiple gunshot wounds and autopsy showed that he was under the influence of PCP at the time of his death. Robert Halford retired from the Tacoma Park Police Department because of permanent damage to his right hand. Today, he continues to look for a job as satisfying as his police career. Robert Pisco, a naval officer, was convicted and fined $500 for driving while intoxicated. He was convicted and given two years probation for assaulting a police officer, a one-year suspended sentence for reckless endangerment. Captain John Pearson was honored as Policeman of the Year by the Murphy Rathborn Post, Veterans of Foreign Wars. His injuries forced him to retire in 1990. If you missed tonight's 10 o'clock news, you can catch the rebroadcast tomorrow morning at...